A massive luxury cruise ship carrying over 4,000 people struck a rock off the coast of Italy. The hull was torn open, creating a 50-meter-long gash, allowing a large amount of seawater to flood in. The ship began to list. Surprisingly, passengers were told that the cruise ship had merely lost power and that there was no serious issue. This incident happened exactly 100 years after the famous sinking of the Titanic. It was the Costa Concordia disaster, which ran aground on rocks in 2012. In 1998, the film Titanic, directed by James Cameron and starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, became a worldwide sensation and one of the highest grossing films of all time, with estimated earnings of around $2,257 billion. After the film's release, this historic event gained even more attention. The Titanic sank in 1912. Over time, luxury cruise ships have become not just a means of sea transportation, but also fantastic venues for ideal vacations. These luxury cruise ships offer various entertainment amenities suitable for all ages, in addition to cabins and restaurants that meet basic needs. As a result, sea vacations have become increasingly popular. Today's story takes place in the Mediterranean Sea, one of the most famous cruise lines is Costa Cruises. Costa Cruises is an Italian travel company that originated from the Costa family in 1860. In 1997, Carnival Corporation, a well-known American travel company, acquired a 50% stake in Costa Cruises. This new shareholder helped the company achieve unprecedented success. Within a few years, Costa Cruises launched several large luxury cruise ships. In 2004, the company ordered a brand new luxury cruise ship from the world-renowned Fincantieri Group. This group, headquartered in Italy, is the fourth largest shipbuilder in the world and the largest builder of cruise ships. After receiving the order from Costa Cruises, Fincantieri Group immediately began designing and constructing a new cruise ship named Costa Concordia. Two years later, the ship was completed and put into commercial service. Let's look at the structure of this ship. The Costa Concordia is 290 meters long, 35.5 meters wide, 52 meters high, has a displacement of 114,000 tons and a maximum speed of 23 knots, approximately 42.6 km h. The total cost of completion was a staggering 450 million euros. This was one of the most luxurious cruise ships owned by Costa Cruises. Here is a comparison between the Costa Concordia in 2012 and the Titanic in 1912. The Costa Concordia is larger than the Titanic. The Costa Concordia had 1,500 cabins, including 505 with open-air balconies, 58 suites, 4 pools, 5 spas and 5 restaurants. There was even a casino, a disco and a large theatre. All facilities on the ship were complete and luxurious. It could be said that this ship had everything you needed, like a mobile city on the sea. The Costa Concordia primarily traveled in the Western Mediterranean. It operated smoothly since its launch in 2006. However, five years later, an unexpected disaster occurred. Many compared it to a new Titanic disaster. What happened on that day? How could such a massive ship run aground? Let's turn back the clock to January 13th, 2012. On January 13th, 2012, at 7 p.m., the luxury cruise ship Costa set sail from the port of Civitavecchia, Italy, right on schedule. The ship was carrying 4,232 people from over 70 countries, including more than 3,000 passengers and over 1,000 crew members. The ship slowly departed the port, embarking on a seven-day voyage around the Western Mediterranean. The journey would include stops at six different ports before returning to the starting point on the final day. The Costa Concordia was targeting the domestic Italian market, and this wasn't its first voyage along this route. After departure, the Costa Concordia sailed the calm waters of the Mediterranean at a speed of 15 knots. The enormous ship looked brilliant at night, 
At that time, the Costa Concordia was heading towards its next destination, the port of Savona in northwestern Italy. The ship's captain was Francesco Schettino, an Italian born in 1960. He joined Costa Cruises in 2002 and was promoted to captain in 2006. He had been the captain of the Costa Concordia since it was launched. By 2012, the ship had safely sailed for over five years. As the ship departed the port, the 52-year-old Captain Francesco stepped onto the stage to welcome everyone on board on behalf of the entire crew and staff. After his speech, all the facilities, including dining and entertainment, opened, operating smoothly and orderly. That night, the ship was supposed to sail between mainland Italy and the island of Giglio, as the deeper waters in this route made it less likely to run aground. However, that day was slightly different from usual. The captain ordered a course change, but due to a calculation error, the ship's turning radius was too large, shifting the actual course westward. The ship came dangerously close to the shore, almost traveling directly north along the island of Giglio. At 9.45 p.m., the ship neared the island of Giglio. Because it was so close to the shore, the ship's port side struck underwater rocks. Although it seemed like a minor collision, the damage to the hull was severe. At the moment of impact, passengers felt a noticeable sway and vibration. The ship's electrical system failed, plunging everything into darkness. A few seconds later, emergency lights came on. Those dining in the restaurant were terrified. Food and drinks fell to the floor, and no one felt like continuing their meal. Mobile phone footage from passengers showed widespread panic, as no one knew what had happened. Restaurant staff tried their best to maintain order, and calmly evacuated everyone. So how severe was the collision? The impact caused water to flood several compartments, including the compressor room, engine room, and two generator rooms. The Costa Concordia had a total of seven watertight compartments. A watertight compartment is an independent section within the hull designed to prevent flooding when the ship encounters an accident. When the hull is damaged and water enters, the intact watertight compartments continue to provide buoyancy, preventing or slowing the ship's sinking. Typically, if a ship floods but its watertight compartments remain intact, there's still a chance of rescue. However, the collision with the rocks damaged three of the seven watertight compartments, causing extensive flooding. The damage was exceptionally severe. Ten minutes after the collision, the ship's radio broadcasted an announcement. However, the truth was not revealed to the passengers. Instead, they were told that the ship had experienced a power outage and that everything was under control. Passengers were also instructed to stay in their rooms and not to worry. Many passengers were skeptical about the announcement, wondering how such a severe jolt could be just a simple power outage. Several passengers donned life jackets and left their rooms. Nonetheless, most people trusted the announcement and stayed in their rooms. To calm some of the passengers, the crew went around to reassure them, explaining the situation and asking them to return to their rooms as the technical issue would soon be resolved. At that time, the captain realized the severity of the situation he immediately contacted the company's crisis control center and reported the ongoing events. However, the company's crisis management center did not inform any other authorities after learning about the incident. Clearly, the company had not grasped the gravity of the situation. The collision had damaged the ship's propulsion system, causing a power failure. The ship's speed decreased from 15 knots to 6.6 .6 knots within five minutes of the collision, and then to 2.9 knots. After 42 minutes, the ship's speed had dropped to 1.1 knots. 
By then, the ship was relying on its small inertia to turn 180 degrees and head towards the shore of Giglio Island. After the turn, the ship's speed dropped to zero. The ship could be blown toward the shore by the wind, and the closer it got, the higher the chances of survival for everyone. At 10.10 p.m., strong winds pushed the powerless ship northward, about 500 meters from the village of Porto on Giglio Island. At that point, the captain finally realized the severity of the situation and called for help from the Italian Maritime Authority, ordering the crew to abandon the ship. The entire crew began evacuating passengers once the order was given. The ship's alarm sounded and the public address system instructed all passengers to put on life jackets, gather on the nearest deck and evacuate via lifeboats. By that time, a significant amount of water had flooded the cabins, causing the ship to list 25 degrees to the starboard side. This made movement on the ship difficult, especially for older passengers. As seawater continued to flood in, all of the ship's generators failed and the water pumps stopped working. The crew could do nothing but watch as the ship tilted further to the right, increasingly out of control. More and more passengers gathered on the deck the crew began lowering lifeboats from both sides of the ship. Rescue ships arrived on the scene to assist with the evacuation. Elderly passengers, women and children were given priority to board the lifeboats. Although some disputes arose during the evacuation, the overall order was maintained. However, lives were at risk. The atmosphere was tense, with occasional screams and cries for help from the passengers. As time passed, the ship's list grew steeper. Every minute was crucial. As lifeboats were gradually lowered, more and more people were successfully evacuated. The crew and rescue workers were extremely busy. However, Captain Francesco, who should have been present to command, was missing. The crew searched for him, needing his decisions, but he was nowhere to be found. In fact, the captain had fled on a lifeboat early on, escaping to the shore of Giglio Island safely. However, he was soon discovered. Captain Gregorio de Falco of the Italian Coast Guard, who was on duty that night, realized Captain Francesco had made it to shore while he was directing the rescue. Mi assicuri che sta andando a bordo. 
io sto andando qua con la lancia dei soccorsi, sono sotto qua, non sono andato da nessuna parte, sono qua. Che sta facendo comandante? Sto qua per coordinare i soccorsi. Che sta coordinando lì? Vado a bordo, mi coordini i soccorsi da bordo. Lei si rifiuta? No, no, non mi sto rifiutando. Lei si sta rifiutando di andare a bordo, comandante? No, 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 E mi dica qual è il motivo per cui non ci va? Ci sto andando perché ci sta l'altra lancia che si è fermata. Lei vada a bordo, è un ordine. Lei non deve fare altre valutazioni. Lei ha dichiarato l'abbandono nave. Adesso comando io. Lei vada a bordo. È chiaro? Comandante. Non mi sente? Sto andando a bordo. Vada. Mi chiami immediatamente da bordo. C'è il mio aereo soccorritore lì. Dove sta il tuo soccorritore? Il mio soccorritore sta a prua. Avanti. Ci sono già dei cadaveri, Schettino. Avanti. Quanti cadaveri ci sono? Non lo so, uno lo so, uno l'ho sentito, me lo devi dire lei quanti ce ne sono, Cristo! No, ma si rende conto che è buio e che qua non vediamo nulla? E che vuole tornare a casa, Schettino? E è buio e vuole tornare a casa? Ma quando... Salga sulla prua della nave tramite la biscagina e mi dica cosa si può fare, quante persone ci sono e che bisogno hanno. Ora! Come? Sono assieme al comandante in seconda qui. Siamo da lì di tutte e due allora. In tutte e due, come si chiama il secondo? Come si chiama il secondo? Dimitri. Dimitri cosa? Dimitri Cristini. Lei e il suo secondo salite a bordo, ora, è chiaro? Cosa? Io voglio salire a bordo, semplicemente che l'altra è stata qua, qua, ci sono gli altri sotto di lui, si è fermata, si è fermata e si è sta alla deriva. Adesso ho chiamato, altri sorco di lei, è un'ora che mi sta dicendo questo, adesso va a bordo, va a bordo e mi viene a dire, e mi viene subito a dire quante persone ci sono. Va bene comandante, sto andando. Gada, subito. During a radio conversation, De Falco sternly reprimanded Captain Francesco and ordered him to return to the ship to oversee the rescue. The recording of this conversation was later widely publicized in the media. Captain De Falco became a prominent figure for openly criticizing Captain Francesco's irresponsible behavior. By the end of 2018, Captain De Falco had been elected to the Italian Senate. Despite De Falco's reprimand that night, Captain Francesco did not return to the ship to take command. The remaining crew continued with the rescue operations. Some generous island residents provided shelter to the rescued passengers. As the ship continued to list to the right, the rescue situation became increasingly dire, especially for passengers still waiting to be saved. These were moments of intense struggle for survival. During the ongoing rescue, a critical moment occurred. As seawater flooded Deck 4, the ship began to tilt faster to the right. Lifeboats were being used, but due to the steep list, lifeboats on the opposite side couldn't be lowered into the water. There weren't enough lifeboats for all the passengers, forcing some to make the perilous decision to jump into the icy water and swim to shore, hoping for survival. This decision led to many injuries and even some drownings. By 2.30 a.m., 300 passengers were still waiting to be evacuated. The ship continued to tilt and eventually settled on the seabed. The entire starboard side was submerged, with the ship listing at an 80-degree angle to the water's surface. The remaining passengers had to rely on ropes to slowly climb down to the lifeboats. Fortunately, most of the remaining passengers were healthy men, capable of aiding the final rescue efforts. The elderly, women and children had been prioritized earlier. The captain's one correct decision was to steer the ship towards Giglio Island before it lost all power, preventing a more catastrophic sinking in the open sea. The rescue operation continued throughout the night. By 6.17 a.m., the initial rescue was complete, with most passengers saved. However, the disaster claimed 32 lives and injured many others. Among the 32 fatalities were five crew members who valiantly helped passengers evacuate until their last breath, demonstrating commendable spirit and responsibility. 
Most of the deaths were due to the ship's list, with passengers unable to escape from the flooded decks. Some were trapped in elevators and couldn't get out. It is unimaginable to comprehend the fear and despair they experienced in their final moments. Shareholders of Costa Cruises paid $13,000, approximately more than 300 million VND, in compensation to each survivor. This amount included the cost of the cruise ticket and other compensation. Costa Cruises later conducted an assessment of the accident. Captain Francesco had brought the ship too close to shore and failed to adhere to the company's safety regulations when handling the emergency. In some instances, his emergency response even violated international standards. Most of the ship's equipment was damaged beyond repair. Let's look at this photo. There is a large gash on the port side of the ship where it struck the rocks. The company determined that the damage from the accident exceeded the ship's cost of 450 million euros, leading to the decision not to repair it. The next step was to salvage the ship. However, lifting a massive 114,000-ton vessel out of the water was no easy task. The company responsible for the salvage was a Dutch maritime service company called Smit International. They had extensive experience in salvaging ships. A large-scale project was then initiated. First, they used oil pumps to extract 2,280 tons of fuel from the ship to reduce its weight. Then, they reinforced the seabed with steel frames to prevent the ship from sinking further. Large flotation boxes were secured to the port side of the ship and steel cables were planned to right the ship. After completing all preparations in September 2013, the Costa Concordia was successfully lifted out of the water as planned. The first phase of the salvage project was completed. The next step was to plan the transportation of the ship to a designated port. On July 27, 2014, 14 escort ships transported the wreck over four days to the port. The ship was then taken to a dock for dismantling. By that time, the total cost of the salvage had reached 1.5 billion euros, while the ship's initial cost was only 450 million euros. The entire salvage and dismantling project was extremely complex. The Costa Concordia had a history of accidents including a collision with the Palermo port wall in 2008. The National Geographic Channel, a documentary television network produced by National Geographic Partners, aired a program called Raising the Costa Concordia. This documentary detailed the process of salvaging the massive ship. After the accident, Captain Francesco was placed under house arrest in Grosseto, Italy, facing charges of manslaughter. Following the incident, Italian media harshly criticized Captain Francesco, labeling him a coward. Some media outlets even called him the most hated man in Italy. Costa Cruises terminated his contract and refused to pay for his legal defense. Besides Captain Francesco, five other crew members abandoned the ship early, including the crisis management director, the cabin service director, the deputy captain, the helmsman, and the third officer. They all admitted to their wrongdoing and pled guilty. The court sentenced them to 18 to 34 months in prison. On February 23, 2013, the trial for Captain Francesco began. He was charged with three counts, manslaughter, responsibility for the shipwreck, and abandoning passengers. According to his testimony, the reason for deviating from the route that night was to perform a saluto maneuver. This maneuver was meant to pay homage to the island and was supposed to be performed as close to the shore as possible. Saluting by ship is a tradition in Italy, Greece and other regions, considered an ancient ritual. When a large ship passes by, it tries to get as close to the shore as possible, with people on the ship and the island exchanging greetings. This ritual continues to this day. This wasn't the first time the Costa Concordia had performed such a maneuver. Previously, someone had photographed the Costa Concordia passing by the island, blowing its horn to greet the island's residents. 
Although the trip had a commercial purpose, it also allowed passengers to witness the ancient ritual and the island's beauty. Additionally, the ship's captain told investigators that the rocks the Costa Concordia hit did not appear on the map. He said, I saw deep water beneath the keel at that time. The ship was about 300 meters from the rocks. After the incident, the Italian media also revealed that Captain Francesco was having an affair with a Moldovan dancer named Domnica Temortan. Initially, she denied the relationship, but later admitted in court that she was his lover. She stated, I boarded the ship on the day of the accident without a ticket. She added, When you are the lover of a crew member, they do not ask for your ticket. She confirmed that the captain had brought her on board that night, but did not want to disclose further details as it was her private matter. Captain Francesco denied that the accident was related to his lover, stating, I saved more lives by trying to steer the ship closer to the shore. When asked by the prosecutor why he abandoned the passengers and left on a lifeboat early, he claimed, I was commanding on deck and accidentally slipped and fell into a lifeboat. It was a claim that no one believed except himself. On February 11, 2015, after a 19-month trial, the verdict for the irresponsible coward was announced. The court found that Captain Francesco had left his post without permission and abandoned the passengers, holding him clearly responsible for the accident. Italy's Supreme Court concluded that Captain Francesco was guilty of all three charges and sentenced him to 16 years in prison, 10 years for manslaughter, 5 years for his role in the shipwreck, and 1 year for abandoning passengers. After the sentence, he expressed dissatisfaction and appealed to the Appellate Court and the Supreme Court in 2016 and 2017, respectively, but the court upheld the initial verdict. Today, luxury sea cruises are becoming increasingly popular. Whether as a means of travel or a mobile resort, the safety of sea journeys is paramount. Each accident serves as a wake-up call for future generations to be well prepared for all scenarios to avoid similar mistakes. Everyone hopes that such tragedies never happen again. One detail that might have been noticed the day of the shipwreck was Friday the 13th. Many believe that Friday the 13th is an unlucky day in many Western countries. This belief has also influenced the thinking of many people in Eastern countries. They think that many unfortunate and unlucky events occur on Friday the 13th, leading many to avoid going out, traveling, shopping or doing business on that day. What do you think about Friday the 13th and the Costa Concordia disaster? This video ends here and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.